So as you can see, the program for drug use in these systems is robust. I would be curious to see what a YouTuber like More Plates, More Dates would have to say about more of the scientific side of the protocol. So I guess spam him with requests to uh, review this video. What's up guys, Derek, moreplacemoredates.com. Today we are going to be reacting to a video I was mentioned in that actually stems from the Matt Fraser, Joe Rogan podcast that we just did the uh, Canelo Alvarez video on. So this is the same uh, episode where they talk about USADA, doping, etc. And in this, uh, in one part of the podcast, they talk about if the USA is uh, has more clean athletes relative to some of the other countries that have historically had like pretty elaborate doping protocols in place. And this video by Zach. Sorry if I say this wrong, Telander, 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 one of those hopefully, talks about me in part of the video and a bunch of people message me about it and um, so we're going to go through it and give my stance and I'm hoping to fuck this video performs well because historically the doping videos don't actually do that good unless it's about a like very prominent fighter that just fought or something like that so I don't know if you guys want to help share this to your friends or something this one might need a bit of an algo boost. To be honest, like I'm expecting, unfortunately, <laughs> not the best. Like I can see on uh, Zach's channel, he has like obviously a, uh, like he has some videos, 80K, 20K, 36K, and then this one, 18, well, it's only 13 hours old, so maybe I'm being a bit pessimistic, but just historically when I do videos on Olympic doping, like even the, du the Duchess cocktail video, I thought was like a very very cool video, you know, breaking down the exact compounds used, how they would, you know, sublingually administer it and absorb it through the mucosal membrane and kind of like swish it around their mouth. That kind of shit, talking about oral trenbolone use, replacing the ball, that was interesting as fuck and it got like no views. So we'll see how this does. I have it on 1.25 times speed, by the way, and I will just try and talk faster. USA is one of very few countries that competes clean. And so it's like, how do you compete, you know? Yeah. Within the first five seconds of this 10 minute clip, the comment section wrote it off. And to me, this is one of the fundamental flaws of non-mainstream media consumption. The hive mind of light givers and loudmouths are rewarded with their quick and quirky commentary, even though contextually, their commentary is very commonly misplaced. Now that first five seconds of the 10 minute clip of Matt Fraser, the five time CrossFit Games winner on the Joe Rogan podcast actually comes off the back of a longer discussion of Matt's experience in, and I cannot emphasize this enough, weightlifting or as what is commonly called Olympic weightlifting, not the Olympics as a whole. And that's pretty much- Is this the same guy from uh, the CrossFit thing? The problem that people seem to have. If so, he put on a fuck ton of size. Out of context, the first thing Matt says is that the US is clean and people assume out of context that he means every single competitor in the Olympics, not specifically to weightlifting. Now, yes, even in America, we have weightlifters who have been you know, proven guilty of using performance enhancing drugs, but I think there's a lot of gray area here that needs to be explored. And hopefully by the end of this video, you can look at what Matt is talking about and think you know, maybe he's more correct than he is incorrect. My father is somewhat of a renowned and respected sports writer who ever since the 80s has exposed and questioned the use of PEDs in sport. And American Olympians, the likes of Marion Jones, were no exception. He never ever would say that the United States is a more honorable country in their decision to use or not use performance enhancing drugs. So for me to sit here and defend the statement that, to be honest, Matt Fraser didn't even really make, that as a whole the US competes cleanly, uh, would be asinine of me to say the very least. What I will argue is that the pharmacological systems in place amongst the countries that were the most common perpetrators of drug use over the years far outweigh any potential. This is interesting. Okay, so we have the actual compounds tested positive for here. This is the 84 Olympics, nandrolone, nandrolone, primabolin, nandrolone, testosterone, ephedrine, ephedrine, or nandrolone, nandrolone, testosterone, primo, nandrolone. Okay. Potential for the U.S. to compete. 88 Summer Olympics, furosemide, Lasix, uh, so two Lasix pops, um, propranolol in the pentathlon, interesting. Um, I was expecting this to be like archery or some shit. <laughs> um, stenazolol, 
Furosemide, furosemide, stanozolol, caffeine. Oh, is this when it was on the uh, prohibited list at the time? Interesting. Compare. Now this was the infamous Ben Johnson stanozolol positive test result. Furthermore, the vast majority of Stracnine is like this super fucking obscure drug. Um, norephedrine, clombuterol, clombuterol. Never even heard of this myself. Mesocarb. Interesting. Drug use that has been documented in the U.S. Ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, stenozolol. Some d ball up in this bitch. Okay. Again, specifically in weightlifting, has come from. Okay, so Marion Jones. Notice how she's the only one with THG. This is the designer drug known as the Clear, developed uh, by Balco Labs, and this was a, uh, you know, the one of the most prevalent, you know, doping stories in the past couple decades. And, um, you know, she was one of the only ones who had access to this drug in particular. And uh, it was undetectable for a while. And the reason being, if you've ever heard me talk about those like Frankenstein compounds that have been resurrected, essentially what they do is these uh, chemists would go look at some of the old, you know, abandoned steroids back in the old um, literature for pharmaceutical development. And they would like, almost similar to how like Superdrol and shit came to be, you would just revive some, well, sort of like Superdrol. You would like go revive a compound that was otherwise proven to be less efficacious than the compounds that were then actually approved for human use, which, you know, subsequently, obviously many of them were pulled from human use because of the way the government intervened because of the whole, you know, scandal around steroid use and shit. But Anyways, THG was a, uh, you know, a designer compound that otherwise could not be detected through GCMS testing because it simply did not have a test design to even detect it. They didn't even know it existed until somebody submitted a sample, kind of just outing them. And then once, uh, once they had access to the sample, they could then develop an assay to detect it. And then everyone kind of got busted that was using it. But this is why there's only like one person using this exact thing. Um, let's see what else. Norandrosterone, nor etio, never heard of that. Uh, Winstrol, Lasix, Nandrolone, Lasix, Nandrolone. A lot of Nandrolones, dude, considering the detection time is so long. Um, I would have to look back at some of the literature and see how new the long-term testing was, though, because this is, again, like, basically the 90s. This is 2000 Sydney. Um, ferrosamide, EPO, HGH. Wow, okay, so we actually had somebody test positive for EPO and HGH for once. Winstrol, Lasix, uh, okay. No name lifters, but we will get into more of that later. 2004 Athens, wow, quite the uh, list here. We have uh, anabolic steroid undisclosed, beta methazone, bulco investigation, stenozolol, um, stenozolol, anavar, um, what interesting shit in here. Clen, diuretic, antipsychotics. Wow. Clenbuterol, testosterone, Lasix, Lasix. See, a lot of Lasix tests, dude. A lot of Lasix tests. So first, let's dive into some documents so we can get a better understanding of the Eastern Bloc or some Russian pharmacology systems in place. The first comes from a newsletter from Sean Waxman, a decorated American weightlifting coach. Okay, so this wasn't that long ago. 2005 doping program. Well, I guess, you know, 16 years ago, kind of a while ago, but... Um, let's see. So we have D ball 35 days out. The fact that these are done so close to the competition just goes to show how not random this shit was. <laughs> he was able to take notes from a Russian national coach in 2005 about their doping program. As you can see here, the list of illicit substances is extensive. And uh, it was very planned around being able to pass a Russian national test which was usually 10 to 15 days out from a wada test see it's interesting how they say the expense of growth hormone is not worth the results he may achieve the same results using testosterone propionate and insulin it's like not even fucking comparable dude like what are they talking about uh like totally different goals here and this is for what sports in particular russian national coach for for what though? If WADA dope tested, let's say 10 days out, athlete continues use of testosterone propionate, GH test patches. They stop the intake of them following same scheme written above. Testosterone up until uh, one day out. Clen 20 days out. Pro yeah, so anyways, a lot of this shit would be picked up through GCMS with ease now, with random testing. So this is obviously based around knowing when you're gonna get tested and making sure all this stuff clears out of your system in time and developing like they could actually pick essentially whatever they wanted 
out of each, uh, you know, the giant clusterfuck of different compounds you could select from because you had an actual deadline as opposed to just randomly getting tested. Like you would never get away with a lot of these things nowadays in a lot of different uh, leagues. Now, some of them you can, but most of them you can't. Like you're not going to be using synthetic d Anivar, Stenozolol. You wouldn't be using Proviron. Probably wouldn't use, be using Clen unless you had a legitimate, you know, loophole excuse. Yeah, some of the shit though you could definitely, I think it's still being deployed nowadays. National coach in 2005 about their doping program. As you can see here, the list of illicit substances is extensive. And uh, it was very planned around being able to pass a Russian national test, which was usually 10 to 15 days out from a WADA test. Some of the notable things on here, a D-ball cycle of 100 tabs total, basically using three to four tabs daily during a cycle. A famous weightlifter used on his own 200 tabs per cycle and was caught at the dope test. However, the athletes who used 120 tabs passed it. Something interesting about this, the dosage, if you compare it to some of the, uh, some of the dosages, you know, claimed from golden era bodybuilders in the 70s and the 80s who would want to make it seem like they're such genetic freaks that they needed fucking nothing. You have like Arnold and guys in that, you know, genre talking about how they'd use like 5 to 10 to 15 milligrams of D-ball per day at most. And then that would be coupled with like one Primo amp per week or something. And it's like obvious, those guys are like the most jack guys on the planet and they're saying their use is lower than what a Russian national team competitor would be doing just for weightlifting in a 35 day cycle, not to prepare for Mr. Olympia where you have to have as much hypertrophy as possible, but for somebody who's trying to take the bare minimum to hit, you know, the efficacious amount and then be able to clear it out of their system in time before a test, you know, granted, these are pretty aggressive dosages for somebody who has a, you know, test deadline within like 20 days or some shit, but you like, yeah, you can get away with it with the pharmacokinetics, understanding them and shit, but I'm just saying the dosages, it kind of just shows how the golden era guys, a lot of them were full of shit. You know, they'd say they did one to two D-ball a day. And it's like, you have guys who look a fraction of the size using three to four times the dosages who are being drug tested. <laughs> a similar thing was done with a very famous drug that's commonly used in weightlifting, which is stenozolol. People know it as Winstrol. And these athletes were taking 10 to 20 milligrams daily, and the cycle was 40 to 50 days. Oxandrolone, as everyone knows, is Anivar, like, and never give up. 10 to 20 milligrams daily cycles, 20 to 35 days. Testosterone probe, 100 milligrams every one, two, or three days, and the cycle is one to two months. This would actually allow you to kind of microdose the testosterone instead of taking massive injections like a bodybuilder would and okay so that was a bit incorrect in my opinion so he's saying this would allow you to do micro doses unlike what a bodybuilder would do who does massive amounts 100 milligrams every day or every other day even every third day like at minimum you're looking at 200 milligrams a week at most you're looking at 700 like uh, most bodybuilders are not using 700 milligrams of test pro per week on top of all this other shit like this is a high dose. This is a very high dose. And you can see just how confident they are the shit's going to be out of their system in time. They're just aggressively going about it. Like this is a hefty test base given the fact that we have 40 milligrams of D-ball in there too. Like that's not nothing. This is a bodybuilder dose right here. Like maybe not a fucking, you know, Olympia caliber IFBB pro open bodybuilder dose. But I mean, you know, for a lot of gym rat guys, a lot of guys competing at regional shows, you know, I, it's probably not even a good comparison because a lot of the guys with shitty genetics at regional shows and national shows, I'm not saying they all do. I'm just saying like a lot of these guys that are, you know, grinding in those shows, they'll use like copious amounts of shit, grams and grams. But just in general, a moderate cycle, I think by most people would be considered, you know, like 500 to 700 milligrams of test with all this other shit. This would be like a pretty aggressive bodybuilder cycle, actually. Some other ones that they talk about as well. But uh, yeah, and, and they also talk. Very aggressive, actually, when you factor in these are all orals about the use of drugs for women. It's very similar. The crazy thing was they started to use drugs early and earlier with people. Now, okay, the, I don't even know for certain, like maybe I misunderstood, but are they using all of these at the same time? Or are these like their selection that they include in their cycles? Like I should probably go back and listen again. All cycle of one to 15 days out from a WADA test list of their Athletes discontinue the intake of these drugs in the following sequence in order to pass the Russian dope test. Okay, so they do use all of these at the same time. They just pull them out in different orders. Okay, 
So yeah, these are all stacked on top of each other. So yeah, this is a pretty fucking hefty cycle if you ask me. A very famous drug that's called Elderwood. And then there's some other ones. They started to use drugs early and earlier with people when they reached uh, the level of master of sport, right? And, and master of sport can be reached as a youth athlete. There's just certain metrics that can be reached and then they start to administer the drugs. Then they know that uh, the drug tests are coming at certain places and times so they can taper them off. One of the notable ones would be Tatiana Kasharina, who was caught at 15 years old. So who knows how long she was doping, but being- Yeah, I think it was, uh, was it the German doping regimen that they had like literally teenage girls on like high doses of Terenable. I forget what it was, but there were some girls who were like so masculinized. They were like, they had to literally transition to males after their competitive careers were over because they were so just viralized after the exposure to the compounds that they were forced to take in order to compete. Being caught at 15 years old, you guys can kind of get an understanding as to you know, how egregious this drug use really, really was. But yeah, some, some lifters, you know, didn't start doping until they were 18, 19 years old. So it really depends on their potential and all these different things. So as you can see, the program for drug use in these systems is robust. I would be curious to see what a YouTuber like More Plates, More Dates would have to say about more of the scientific side of the protocol. So I guess- Aggressive as fuck. But if I was, you know, like I understand why they did it because they were like, we're, we're basically gonna do the fucking kitchen sink and we're gonna pull it out as close as we can, but ensure you're gonna pass. So like, this is a lot of stuff, dude. Like you're looking at 40 milligrams a day, you're looking at what, 280 milligrams um, per week. You're looking at, you know, 20 milligrams of Winstrol per day, 140 milligrams per, per week. Let me pull out a fucking calculator here, actually. So we have 280, this is the high end, 280 milligrams of D-ball plus 140 Winstrol plus 140 Anivar plus, let's just say, I don't know, 500 test plus 50 milligrams proviron per day. So we're looking at 300, 350 milligrams of proviron per day plus, okay, I'm not even gonna count the micrograms from the clen. So you're looking at like almost a gram and a half of shit. Like it's a pretty hefty cycle, you know, especially when all of these are, you know, orals essentially, except for the uh, test base here. And uh, eight, four to five I use twice a day of GH is a fucking shit ton too. And that clendose is also very high. Like I'd be worried about like people's hearts when I'm, uh, you know, administering all this shit simultaneously plus 120 micrograms of clen. So that's uh, extreme. So yeah, this is pretty aggressive for sure. This is, this is bodybuilder dosages. Curious to see what a YouTuber like More Plates, More Dates would have to say about more of the scientific side of the protocol. So I guess spam him with requests to as far as like the choices of compounds, it seems like, <laughs> let's circle back. It looks just like a clusterfuck of shit too. So like if it were me, am I going to get any performance out of Proviron? Like probably not. Like why the fuck would I, what am I doing? Like binding up my non-existent SHBG? Like no thanks. This is just a like heavily androgenic compound that has like no real utility in a performance setting based on the other compounds in play here. Um, test probe, obviously, you know, some of these are obviously work. It's just, I feel, it feels like somebody took like every compound they had access to and they were like, take it all like that. That's what it feels like. This is assume your content, but up next is a paper called reflections on Valentin Christov's champion on a cross. Uh, and this paper was written by Michael Clayton. So Ristov was a successful lifter under the famous Bulgarian coach, Ivan Abidjeev. And the term Bulgarian style lifting came from his original style of lifting or system of lifting, if we can even call it that, and has been completely bastardized in the modern use of that terminology. This is great, by the way. This feels like I'm watching a documentary. Amongst strength enthusiasts. The main understanding of Bulgarian lifting is that you pretty much want to lift heavy and specific every day. However, it's, it's much different than that. There really is no possibility of Bulgarian lifting outside of the places that Abijev created within his own facilities. So Ristov, just after he turned 18, entered a tournament in Armenia and he snatched 162 kilos and jerked 200 kilos at a body weight of 100 kilos. And he was very proud of this because he said that he did this completely clean. And it is absolutely possible for an 18 year old to snatch 162 and clean and jerk 200. It's unlikely because those numbers are very, very elite and, and very promising for a 100 kilo lifter. 
but it is absolutely possible. There are people with good genetics out there. There are good athletes out there. However, it starts to get interesting where Kristoff is approached by Abijayev saying, you should do the European championships in two months. And what Abijayev says is, you should gain an extra 10 kilos of body weight to lift in the 110 kilo category. This was the first time that he was exposed to anabolic steroids at 18 years old. And fast forward to two months later, he weighed in in Verona at 108 kilos, and this was his first international meet, and he took silver by snatching 167 and clean and jerking 220 kilos. So he put on five kilos onto his snatch, and he put on 20 kilos onto his clean and jerk. We see in this clip Matt talking about these junior lifters who are snatching his clean and jerk. And there are accounts, especially from Cheryl Hayworth, of these lifters in the States and elsewhere who don't have these systems of doping, where they're beating these people and they're hanging with them. And then a year later, these people who they were beating and they were hanging with before are now absolutely destroying them. Yeah, if you have access to like the whole gamut of shit though, where you can literally take a gram and a half of like every compound you have access to, like, I'm not surprised if somebody puts 50 pounds on a main lift in a year or whatever it is. Like, I remember one of my first cycles, just it was like basic like test and D-ball and I put on like, I don't know, 50 pounds on my bench. Like, this is not uncommon. But nowadays, you know, depending on what you can get away with, you're not gonna see as drastic of jumps in performance in most sports, I would think, depending on how aggressive the testing is, of course. So, but here in like the 70s, I'm not surprised that stuff like this was happening in like short durations of time. And this is kind of that master of sport mentality. You know, these people were on the cusp of being the elites in their systems. So they added in drugs and then absolutely smashed the competition. This was not uncommon, especially in the junior world championships. By the way, I don't recommend combining test and D-ball. <laughs> I'm just, that was just one of my first cycles and it was uh, very estrogenic to say the least. So up next in this review, Christoph starts talking about his pre-Olympic doping use. And this is when it just gets ridiculous. So Abijayev was giving each lifter 180 Dianabol tablets of five milligrams per week. Okay, so 128 milligrams per day. That's still less overall drug burden than the fat cycle with all the other stuff we saw before. However, obviously this is more oral then, you know, back at least that one had like a split between injectable and oral, but. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday were 40 pill days. Jesus. And Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday were 20 pill days. They were also being injected with the steroid Ritabolil. Oh, classic. The good old Deca D ball cycle. There were also just heavy doses of vitamins as well. How much, wait, so they were being injected with the steroid Nandrolone Decanoate one day a week? but it doesn't say the dosage. Where does it say Retaboli is, uh, am I missing what the fuck? I'll just, oh, uh, is it up here? I'm just trying to see where he gets the reference that Retaboli is Nandrolone and Decanoate. I'll just take for his word that it is. So anyway, D-ball Decacycle, classic. Retabolil. There are also just heavy doses of vitamins as well as other substances that they didn't know about what they were getting. And Harisov notes that his urine turned brown and that he started to see stars in his eyes when he was lifting. So, you know, you can imagine if you're on 128 milligrams of D-ball per day, the amount of water retention you would have, you know? Like, D, you know, D-ball, I think, often gets a bad rap because it's often stacked with test, and then you get this heavy-duty Michelin man look, especially with DECA. But on its own with DECA, it's not as problematic nearly, but 128 milligrams, like, obviously, a, you know, fat fucking dose, probably far above what you, you know, e easily well above where you're getting diminishing returns. And um, it's not surprising that this guy's blood pressure is probably through the fucking roof. This guy was probably, uh, you know, having nosebleeds in the middle of his set. So wouldn't be surprised. And even just like walking around and he would pass out at the gym. Through all of this, Christoph persisted. And in the coming weeks, he worked up to a snatch of 192 and a clean and jerk of 250. He's quoted as saying, without the horse-sized doses of the white pills, which were the steroids, and the injections of the Ritabolil, of course, that kind of workout intensity would be entirely impossible. Now, though shocking, these practices were commonplace amongst these countries. And the main thing here is that these practices were nowhere near what was done in the United States in weightlifting. 
not even close. If there ever was anything that was done in weightlifting, it was completely clandestine to that individual list lifter. With USADA coming in and the out of competition testing, it would only be a matter of time before they were either caught or they weren't able to take as many drugs as any other country and it wouldn't even benefit them or at least benefit them to the level that they could have if they knew when the tests were coming. Even when we see the massive corruption within the governing body of weightlifting, the IWF, with the release of the McLaren Report, and if you guys don't know what the McLaren Report is, please watch the video I'd made about this uh, for more of an understanding. But the US and other countries that we consider to be clean uh, in this modern era of weightlifting who are very tough on drugs within the sport, they're nowhere to be found in this McLaren Report. However, this does not imply that even US weightlifters are exempt. Let's take a cruise down to the old USADA sanction list. As we can see, there are a whole lot of names on this list. However, for 99% of the names on this list, they are, in the eyes of the IWF, WADA, and the IOC, nobodies. They will never compete on an international stage. So these sanctions, for the most part, are in competition sanctions with not really competitive people. The out of competition testing is reserved for the lifters with the highest Roby points, our ranking system to determine Olympic spots. And out of competition testing, though many commenters think is a joke for some odd reason, is competition testing, though really I'm just gonna read this thing he had pop up here. He said it conducts in competition, out of competition tests. Out of competition tests is conducted with an individual athlete in an out of competition setting with little or no advance notice of the test. In competition is generalized, generally conducted during or following an event. USADA collects both urine and blood samples, including dry blood spot testing as part of its program. So the urine in general is used to screen for synthetic compounds, you know, GCMS testing to detect anabolic stimulants, etc. Then the blood would be used to actually develop your biological passport. And then based on the results of that, they would use, well, if you didn't blatantly test for positive for something synthetic, they would use your biological passport and or certain ratios in the urine as a way to screen for if subsequent testing is warranted to kind of find endogenous compounds that would otherwise be harder to detect with the initial screening methods. So let's see, USADA utilizes special analysis testing, including but not limited to HGH, erythropoietin, and carbon isotope ratio, um, isotope ratio mass spectrometry testing, and collects additional data as a part of the athlete biological passport program. So yeah, these, a lot of these though, are not things you would do off the bat. They would be subsequent tests that are more expensive and more in depth that are deployed after kind of like tripping a red flag in something in the either, you know, T to E ratio, one of the other ratios they have developed or something in your biological passport. Obviously, if you, you know, test positive for something synthetic that's like blatantly shouldn't be there, like fucking trend blown, like boom, you're just done. But if you have something endogenous and it looks a little off, you know, that's where the subsequent testing comes out to kind of have confirmation testing of HGH, erythropoietin, carbon isotope ratio testing for the testosterone, etc. So, you know, I don't know necessarily know that guys testing positive that aren't notable is really like somehow, maybe I'm totally misinterpreting, but somehow like reinforces the credibility of high caliber athletes that have, you know, more resources to kind of get around the shit. I'm not saying that everyone's cheating, by the way, either. I'm just saying, like, if they wanted to, I think there's ways to get around it. And I'm not saying everyone is. I'm not saying USA is, you know, full of cheaters or some shit. I'm just saying people are definitely still using stuff and people are definitely still testing positive. It's just fewer and more far between. And the good thing, though, is there's far more barrier to entry now than there used to be in terms of, you know, like you saw how ridiculous that protocol was from uh, the Russians or whatever, it was like at one and a half grams of shit, unless my math is like way off, but of synthetic compounds that would all pop in fucking two seconds in a random test using like the basic screening analysis. So a lot of the stuff you could get away with years ago, you cannot now. So it's like a very, a much smaller margin of error than it used to be. And that margin being so small is going to screen out a ton of people who would otherwise have cheated if they felt like they could get away with it. But of course, that again, depends on the budget of the league we're talking about, how elaborate they're going to test, you know, how much of a budget do they have to allocate to it? How random really is it? You know, logistical concerns, you know, country, you know, who they're hiring to carry out their tests and shit. Some of the stuff like that. But in general, like the thing I said about the summarization of the actual uh, what type of test does USADA conduct? This part, um, still applicable in my opinion. I think people are definitely uh, 
There's still a margin. And out of competition testing, though many commenters think is a joke for some odd reason, is actually very stringent and hard to pass. Yeah, so it's definitely not easy to pass this stuff. You know, it's a lot more rigorous than it used to be. There's more randomization. There's more uh, just in general budgets being allocated to it in order to kind of uh, put the public at ease about the, uh, I don't know, credibility of the organizations and shit. So it's definitely not easy to get around. Like there's a reason why when USADA came into the UFC, so many physiques, you know, fell apart. Like people are being dissuaded severely from trying because the margin of error is way fucking smaller than it used to be. You can't just get away with a therapeutic use exemption for uh, TRT, you know, in the UFC anymore. Like there's a lot of shit back in the day that, uh, well, not even that long ago that you could have, you know, got away with easily and had significant performance enhancing advantage. But nowadays the, uh, the margin is a lot smaller for sure. USADA reserves the right to come to your house on any given day to test you in your allotted hour, and if you don't comply, you will be sanctioned. I can already feel, I can already sense the comments pouring in, pointing out that <laughs> even athletes in the out of competition testing pool can get away with it. To which I say, you are absolutely right. And there will always be lifters that decide to cheat. But it isn't as simple as having a direct tapering of the drugs like the Russians did in that 2005 example. Exactly, so you're not gonna get such a drastic advantage like you would have before. Well, actually, you know, you could argue to some extent. Eh, no, probably not. <laughs> like you can get away with certain things, but again, the protocols in line, like keep you in check. Like even if you're going to get away with certain things that skirt around the more elaborate tests, you're still gonna be confined within a reasonable dosage allocation before you would still pop for, you know, something else that would be like, there's way too big of a red flag here to like let this guy go just because he cleared, you know, both these tests. So yeah, like there's no chance you're gonna be able to get away with, you know, a gram and a half of like every single synthetic compound like ever fucking made and just like taper it out of your system in time. It's just, it's just not gonna happen. So in Matt's case, when he was a junior, he is more correct than he is incorrect when we talk about weightlifting specifically, which he was. Though this inference will lead to more gray area, it is the only logical one. Most people don't enjoy the gray area. We prefer to write things off. A lot of comments are just gonna say, they're all on gear, or drugs don't make the lifter and they work harder and are more genetically gifted and have better technique, or the lifter is completely clean. Even in this video where I offer up a deeper understanding and still leave the idea in question that the US is clean, I leave that open-ended. I'm sure that someone in this comment section will write off the argument as something that it is not. But that is part of what we do on YouTube. So where do we go from here in the sport of weightlifting? Well, one thing is for sure. Corruption at the level we were seeing within the IWF, which again is the governing body of weightlifting, must go away. Then we will see more sanctions come and less systemic doping, which we're actually already seeing because of the requirements to compete. Beyond this, our hands are tied. They're always going to be lifters from anywhere, the US included, in the world who cheat. However, the current OOC testing, at least by the USADA model, really isn't that bad. Right now it's the best option we have, and if someone slips through the cracks, I guess there really is nothing we can do about it. But the corruption that we have seen before allows for lifters to be systematically allowed through the cracks. So again, if in this case, Matt had said something along the lines of US weightlifting is clean insofar as when compared to the doping systems of other nations and the OOC testings of other nations, we are not even able to measure up remotely to the amount of drug use. If anyone knows this guy's history more, let me know in the comments section if you think he's natty or not, because I've had, I've had a lot of requests to do a natty or not on this guy, and I haven't done enough research to give any sort of definitive statement, to be honest, but, and this video is more just talking about the, you know, drug test protocols and whatnot, but let me know what you guys think. I'm curious, because I haven't, uh, apparently he's like one of the most infamous uh, CrossFit um, champions of all time or something. So I, I don't say that to underplay, you know, his accomplishments, by the way, I just actually don't know. So let me know what you guys think. That might be a good way to help engage the algo. Cause I, I honestly don't think this video is going to do very well. Hopefully I'm wrong, but, um, this was great insight by Zach and I appreciate, uh, the deep dive it was entertaining for me to watch, especially it's just unfortunate that more people don't find this stuff is entertaining as I do, I guess, because they usually don't pick up as much steam as like some of my other stuff. So anyways, let's see uh, what he says here to cap it off. Then I'd hope more people would get on board with what he said. In my opinion, what he said really isn't that controversial.
Cool. Okay. Well, that was a good video. I don't know if uh, Zach Tellender has uh, more stuff about, uh, it looked like he had another doping video, which looked cool. I might add it to my watch list and um, looks like a cool channel. I like the uh, documentary style. A lot of a lot of time definitely went into editing this. So definitely uh, check his stuff out. Give him a drop a like on his video sub if you're interested in seeing more uh, relevant stuff to that. And uh, yeah, like here, subscribe, comment aggressively for the algo because I don't know. I don't know what this video is going to do. So anyways, thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplacemoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram at moreplacemoredates, Facebook, Snapchat, Bitchu, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below. My TRT clinic, it's all telemedicine from the comfort of your own home. Gorilla Mind, nootropic formulas, Gorilla Mode, pre-workout formulas to design myself from scratch and anything else I'm associated with. It's all in the video description below, including my recommended lab tests and diagnostics. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.